Okay, so let's begin first with a just a grounding meditation. So I just like to invite you to come into your comfortable seated shape, whatever that feels like. Close the eyes and lengthen up through the spine and just take deep breaths in and out. Just notice once you slow down and sit still, you start to quiet the mind and often in this state, you can start to hear the whisper of the heart. Writing the mind and hearing the whisper of the heart. Just take a couple more breaths in, in this space and shape. As you're ready, you can just gently bring the eyes back to open. Fabulous. Okay, welcome back. So we're here for another episode of Sober Yoga Girl podcast that we're recording in the Sober Girls Club. And I'm so excited to be sitting here with Arlena Allen today. Arlena Allen is the host of a top 1% podcast called the, do you call it the ODAT podcast or do you call it the one day at a time podcast? You know, it's funny. So it used to be ODAT chat when I first started it eight years ago. And then I realized people sort of outside of the recovery community, they didn't know what ODAT meant. <laughs> so I was like in my little sober bubble and I thought everybody knew. So I changed it to just the one day at a time recovery podcast. It's very confusing because the website is still ODAT chat. <laughs> what are you going to do? I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't think I knew what ODAT was until <laughs> like a little while into my sobriety. So that's so funny. How things what just was I happen. thinking? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. It's fine. It's fine. Well, I would love if you could share with us a little bit about your sobriety journey just to start us off. Sure. Yeah. And you'll have to like, so I, this is like my favorite thing to talk about and I tend to ramble. So if you have a question or you think I should take a breath, just sort of wave at me and I'll <laughs> pay attention. Um, but I always, so when I interview people like I, you know, and I had you on my podcast, I'm always curious about like family of origin and like the beginning part. Cause I feel like that kind of sets the tone for the rest. Right. And so when I was little, there was a couple of things that happened to me that sort of um, shaped my identity, my sense of self-esteem and my value. Um, I was sexually abused by a neighbor starting at the age of five. And then when I was about seven years old, my parents divorced and growing up in the church, I sort of had like these messages of, you know, how I should be, um, ideals that I was supposed to sort of, uh, live up to. And I sort of got this idea that, you know, these experiences left me feeling like there was something wrong with me. And I don't think that's actually a very unique experience. I feel like a lot of people kind of grow up with some of those feelings, like not belonging or fitting in or things like that. But, uh, you know, that's just how it went down for me. And um, my parents uh, were really nice people. Um, Daddy was from Kentucky and grew up in the church. He was uber religious we used to kind of tease him that he was so heavenly minded. He was of no earthly good. <laughs> he didn't really live in the real world, the rest of us. Um, but he's just a sweet guy. But he he um, he was like a former military guy. 
and um, worked at places like Lockheed and NASA. So it kind of gives, he's like a G-man, right? He's like a government guy, very like conservative. And my, my mom is from Mexico city and she is just a firecracker. And, but uh, when they divorced, you know, my dad surprisingly was like the nurturing one. He was the gentle nurturing one and he left. And so I have an older sister and she and I were sort of left to be raised by my mom. And he was like right around the corner. Like as soon as he moved out, I got on my bicycle and was able to ride to his house. He was that close. Um, Yeah. And back in the day at seven years old, you could do that. (laughs) I would never let my kids do that, but uh, that's beside the point. Um, Anyway. um, Yeah. So my mom, so I grew up with my mom and my sister mostly And my mom kind of had two predominant feelings. She was either really happy or she was really angry. And I kind of felt like she saved her happy face for the outside world. And so that left me with two predominant feelings. It was like guilty and wrong were sort of my predominant feelings growing up. And I really feel like that had a huge impact on how I saw myself, my identity, and um, how I felt in the world in terms of like safety. I didn't really feel like I belonged. I didn't feel safe. And, um, you know, growing, you know, now I'm, you know, a mother, I, you know, I have two grown boys, but I, I have more compassion for my mom now because I can see, you know, she was like working two jobs all the time. And my, you know, my dad was obviously doing his um, part in, you know, paying child support and all that, but still it was rough, right? We grew up kind of poor. Um, and uh, I know that when she would come home from work, you know, I'd hear her car pull into the driveway and I like terror would I would be like looking around like, what didn't I do? You know, so she was usually upset. She had to come home tired and upset and, you know, stressed out and the house would be a mess. And, you know, my sister and I were responsible for like cleaning and doing stuff around the house. And I I was not the compliant child. My sister was like the straighty student compliant child. I was not. (laughs) Um, I was the fun girl. (laughs) <laughs> so anyway, um, so that's kind of, so that kind of sets the stage for the rest. Right. And early on, um, my mom had gone out on a date and I thought it would be a great idea to drink some of the booze that was in the cabinet. And I'm not really sure where that idea came from. Cause I didn't see either of my parents drink, but I remember that first drink and I was probably like eight or nine. Like I was really young. And, uh, I remember that first drink, how it like burned my lips, how it burned all the way down. But what was so striking to me was when it hit bottom, the warmth that spread through my whole body. And I didn't realize how bad I felt. It was like it was like all the self-consciousness and self-loathing and self-hatred that I already had towards myself at that age. Like all that was removed and all that was left was like this happy feeling And the juxtaposition between those two feelings like burned in my psyche forever. And I was like, oh my God, this is the thing. Like, I love this feeling. And um, my sister did not drink. She's a couple years older than me. She, I got sick. She cleaned me up, put me to bed. And that began our codependent alcoholic relationship (laughs) from that point on. And, um, you know, obviously I didn't become a daily drinker at nine. So, but uh, when I was like 14 years old is when I started drinking pretty regularly. Like sometimes I would drink before school, we would drink on the weekends, um, you know, like around 14, you know, was kind of when it took off. And I think you sort of had something around 14 too, right? There's something about that yeah. 14 age where you lose your get the mind, like all your hormones start kicking in or something. I don't know. But uh, I've interviewed like, you know, almost 400 people now that's it's so interesting that early teenage years is kind of when it kicks off for a lot of people. And that was definitely true for me. And so from 14 to 25, when I quit drinking, I had a lot of what I would call episodes, right? Like I never really, like I would start drinking and then there's like these alter egos would come out. It was either badass Benzie or whippy Wendy. Cause I was either fighting or crying when I was drinking. It was like, I, it was, uh, I, to manage my feelings, I would just, it was suppression. That's how I managed my, just try to show all that down. But when I drank, like it would all explode. And so I would have these like crazy nights, like not all the time. And I didn't drink every day. I was like definitely a binge drinker. But uh, yeah, I just never could predict what was going to happen or who would come out. And um, 
yeah, later on, I figured, I found, I realized, oh, you know what? There was a third alter ego, Slutty Susan. <laughs> and she always, she always showed up. Everybody loved her. Like literally. <laughs> um, so that was fun. I went through a little hoe phase, um, which I don't think is unusual. We can laugh about it now, but I tell my, I, I tell people the only married man I sleep with now is my husband, which he appreciates. <laughs> um but yeah, so I mean, there was just all these shenanigans for a long time. And I just got to that point where I was just like, I hated who I was. I really hated who I was. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And um, I had a really bad night with my sister. She and I went out. We had a really bad night. And I hurt her and caused a scene. I almost got arrested. Um, and the next morning I woke up and I was like, I was like, what is wrong with me? And that began, that was the time I started questioning my drinking. And it took me two years of trying to moderate and, con and control my drinking before I finally hit that like low bottom point when I was 25, where I was like, I'm never drinking again, you know, and I took a big bong hit. <laughs> Weed was a big part of my, my story, but, um, I had some friends. I was in a, um, I had this job where I was, um, a sales job where I was dealing with mostly men shipping, receiving it was a transportation company I was working for. And two of my customers were sober and they were both in the program. And so we're talking 93, 93, there, there were no memoirs. There were no alternative programs like this. They know we have stuff like this. There was no social media. There was none of that really. It was the only thing I knew that there was rehab, but for some reason, I didn't think I needed it. Um, like in my mind, I, the image I had of somebody who was like alcoholic or alcohol dependent was like like the um, the guy in the trench coat with the paper bag over the bottle. Like that's what I thought an alcohol. That's what a, per, a person with a problem with drinking looked like. Like I didn't see any women like me, certainly at 25, that were having problematic drinking. So that was really the only thing that was available at the time. And these two guys were like, yeah, you should, you should check this out. And I remember they showed me the steps and I was like, uh, okay, whatever. Like it didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't get it at all. And then there's like all this God stuff and powerlessness and alcoholic. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know about all this. And, um, so they, but I really, I, I just wanted to change. I was tired of trying it my way, which was not working. And I was like, okay, whatever, I'll just go visit. I'll just check it out. And I remember that first meeting I went to where someone wrote like, welcome home on the board. And um, they start, people started sharing these stories and I couldn't reconcile the story that they were telling with who I was looking at. I was like, this lady is telling this story of this. And, and number one, I was shocked that she would even admit some of the things that she had done. I was like, oh my God, they can hear you. What are you shh, like? Shut it down. But um, yeah, these people would tell these stories. And I was, I was just gobsmacked. I was like, I can't believe. And they didn't, they said these stories with no shame. I was like, what is happening? But like I could tell that they got my kind of crazy. Like they, I was like, oh my God, they, they know, like, I was thinking I was the only one who felt that way. And so yeah, I was, um, I immediately felt like I was at home and I just kept going back and Mitch and Randy, these, these two guys I was, um, working with, they immediately turned me over to the women. They were like, oh, the women work with the women. And so I started doing the thing. And I was like, yeah, I don't know about this God thing. And, they were, and and I got this woman sponsoring me. She was like, oh, don't worry about that. It's like, she's like, what would you, she would start breaking down the stuff. She, she'd be like, well, what do you want God to be? Like, if you could pick a God, what would you want it to be? And what would you not want it to be? Make two lists. So I wrote the list of all the things I wanted it to be, like loving, compassionate, like all this positive stuff, forgiving, you know, um, like the master organizer, planner, omnipresent. And then, but like not judgmental, not like all the things of my childhood that didn't resonate with me. Like I wrote, she, and so I, she goes, oh, let me see your list. So I handed her my list and she tore it in half and she gave me the good side. She goes, let's just start with this. How about that? And I was like, oh, you can do that? Like I didn't, that's not how I was raised. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of just how we started. And I heard people share all these different concepts of their higher power. Like one guy said his higher power was water because it was like, and he gave all these 
reasons. And I just thought it was so interesting. All these people had all these different ideas, just like energy or the energy of love or whatever. And anyway, um, I was so desperate to be sober. I did everything this gal told me to do. She said, we're going to do all these steps. And she explained that it wasn't powerless over life. It was just alcohol. It's the, and it's actually under like powerless over alcohol. It's like the complete phrase. And I was like, oh, all right, well, whatever. She's like, we actually have a lot of power. So her approach is sort of like this empowerment thing. And, you know, step three was like, turn your will and your life over to the care of God. I was like, well, what does that mean? Like, do I'm, I'm like, I don't, I was confused. And she was like, well, God, in her mind, she was like, well, to me, it's like God lives inside me. And so when I turn my will over to God, it means I'm, I'm listening for, like you were talking about in the beginning about the whisper of the heart. And she's like, that's what that is. I go, oh, okay. Well, that makes sense. It's not like I'm surrendering my intellect or uh, discernment or responsibility to something else. It's like, oh, I take responsibility. I'm listening to that quiet voice. So um, anyway, that's how it went on and on. And we did all the steps and the four step was probably the most profound and magical experience of my life because it was a process of sorting through all my baggage in a very practical, pragmatic way where I could say, oh, this is mine. This is not mine. And, um, oh, I, I, for me, I was like kind of playing the victim a lot. Mm-hmm. And so like other people were like, other people were hurting me. And then I real like in some instances, I was able to see, oh, I kept showing up for shitty relationships. It's like, they were, they were, they would hurt me and I would go back for more. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, oh, I don't have to do that. I have the power of choice right? I I have power. So it was, that's kind of how it went. And um, it's been 30 years. I met my husband there and I kept going back to the meetings because not to stay sober, but it was like a community, like I needed community. And it was ni- a nice way to sort of, um, you know, review this information that was helping, that got me sober. And um, it was an, a good, it, just an easy place to go to, like service is a big part of 12 step. So I was able to sponsor other women and that's where I found people I could be of service to. Um, And then I had, you know, mentors there, they call them sponsors. Um, But, and these women, you know, that walked ahead of me, they were raising their kids and working these great jobs and, and teaching me how to be the woman I wanted to be. So yeah, it's been 30 years. It's been pretty, pretty cool. That's incredible. (laughs) Congratulations on your 30 years too. That is a huge, a huge, huge success. Thank you. Yeah. 30 felt big. 30 felt like, oof, I'm old. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, damn. They they say just don't drink and don't die and you'll stay. (laughs) You'll have 30 years. You can have 30 years too. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. So I love hearing about your story and I am so curious about some of the myths that I hear about AA specifically, because I have to admit, like I myself was pretty resistant towards the idea of AA for a long time um, because of some of these things. And so I have a question. I mean, you've already brought it up, like this idea of like um, the need to be religious, to be part of AA and this idea for like different forms of a higher power. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And, and I'll just say that, um, the things I've heard since I started doing the podcast eight years ago, I've heard some terrible stories and, um, you know, and I just want to say that they're all valid. I'm not trying to pretend like it's perfect or anything. I'm not, and I'm not one of those that's going to say this way is the only way, or you got to go to meetings forever. I'm, I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying that the 12 step process is a worthy endeavor. Mm -hmm. And going through the process is something that allowed me to make sense of things like a higher power. I I grew up in the church and at some point I I was like, I had been begging God my entire life to fix me. And here we are, right? Like, it's like not fixed. Um, But in that idea was the idea that I was broken, right? And I'm not, and I never was. And I didn't know that. And, um, And so when I got to AA and I saw God, I was like, I can't do this. 
I can't do this. And she's like, oh, there's a difference between spiritual and religious, right? Like religious has a lot of dogma and rules and things that you have to believe and stuff. And like, this is not that like, and she was like, let me introduce you to my friend, Neil, who is atheist, who found a way to work the steps. And he basically focuses on principles and values and um, character traits and things like that. And I was like, oh, okay, you don't have to be religious. So that's kind of how I got that. I know that that's a big hurdle for a lot of people. And because it says God, it could be, and it would, and to be fair, it is based, you know, Bill W who wrote it is, was religious. He was Christian. And, um, and it comes from the Oxford group, which was very religious. And so that's why they started the 12 step because they recognize a need for, for it to be more uh, flexible than that. So that was one of the things I was like, okay, I can get past that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, that's something that in my early days, I think I would have been a little bit turned off of, but now um, as my spiritual practice has deepened, it would be something that I would probably be a lot more, well, I know I would be a lot more comfortable with it coming into to a meeting. Yeah. Yeah. And also, um, you know, you mentioned meetings. Um, so there's the program, which is the steps Mm -hmm. and then there's the fellowships, which are the, like people at the meetings. And, um, when I wrote the book, I really separate the two. They're two separate things. They're intended to work together, but they don't always like people who live in really rural areas where there's only like one or two meetings a week. Like if you don't fit in to that meeting, it's, it's a problem. It's a real problem. But now we have online meetings and things like that from all over the world. And, and so that's not as much of a barrier anymore, but um, yeah, they're two separate things. And I have found that when people have a problem of like, if they try the 12 step program, like if they try going to AA um, and they have a bad experience, it's typically with the people. Right. And, and so yeah, um, that's why I separate them because the people are not the program. The people don't represent the organization as a whole. And these are people who, you know, to be fair, I have some, I have some mental illness. It, we're talking about mental illness here. Like, and I don't mean that in a shamey way. Like if you had a cold, I wouldn't be like, oh, you're sick. You should be ashamed of that. It's like, oh, I have some, um, I have trauma. I have um, dysfunctional coping skills. I've been in survival mode for the last 20 years. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's what I mean when I say mental illness and and the alcohol is just a coping skill. That's all that was, right? So um, these are people that are um, trying to get better, right? They need a safe place to go get better, but they're not better yet, right? A lot of them are not better yet. And so sometimes they're problematic, but I, f- I find like you find those people everywhere. They're at work. They're um, in religious groups. They're, I mean, they're everywhere. So the book is sort of like, here are some guidelines, have some boundaries. Not everybody is safe, but focus on the literature because that's different than, than the people. So hopefully it's helpful. That is such an important differentiation because you're absolutely right that it's like um, the the people, even in my own experience, like in in a sober community that I was part of, um, you know, it was still an incredible, incredible program, despite me not connecting with the leader at the end, like there was a fallout, but that was with him as a person. It wasn't with what the program provided me. And so I love that you've distinguished that because I think that's really important. Yeah, people. Yeah. When you mentioned leaders, so um, the, in most meetings, not all, but they say that there are no there are no leaders they are just trusted servants. Right. But there. But so the thing that's problematic at meetings sometimes is there becomes this um, power differential, like people with a lot of time yeah. are are kind of put on a pedestal and people default to them. And, and what I say is, like, let's focus on the literature because that person doesn't represent the organization as a whole. And, and like what you said, if like, if there's a fallout or there's a problem in the group, people are like, they throw the baby out with the bathwater. They're like, Oh, this whole thing is nuts. This thing is a joke. Like I was talking to this lady the other day and she's like, Oh, I went and the leader, he was so controlling and made everybody feel bad. And then come to find out he was drinking. What a joke. It is a joke. And I was like, that's one dude one dude he doesn't represent the organization did you read the literature like are we just trusting what he said so 
I, so I kind of fall between this, like, don't trust what people say. Like you can, you sometimes need to get additional context and information from the members, which can be helpful. But at the end of the day, you need to practice discernment and take responsibility for yourself and actually read what the literature says. Mm. You know, I mean, not be a bit, but <laughs> yeah. What you said there was profound because I was just thinking to how, like, you know, I've come across yoga teachers, for example, that don't embody yoga very well. And I wouldn't say like yoga is a joke because that one teacher didn't embody the principles, right? I would be like, well, that person is not in practice, but yoga as a whole is still a value to my life. And so I love that comparison you've made because that that was a bit of a light bulb for me. That's a that's a great example. I'm if you don't mind, I'm I might have to steal that for future Absolutely. conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. So I have a question for you. You brought up something about how um you started to realize that you weren't broken. Um one of the things I attended one AA meeting in person in Bali and then I've done a few since then with the Community Recovery 2.0, which has a bit of different language, still still the same program. But um, in the AA meeting in Bali, what I noticed was there were a few people who were referring to themselves as defected. And that was something that stuck out to me of like, oh, I don't really resonate with that. And so I was wondering, like, what's your take on that? Have you been experiencing that language? and, And what do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. That is such a good point because uh, in the literature, they talk about character defects, Mm -hmm. right? And so um, what isn't emphasized are character assets, Mm -hmm. right? Like once you actually start doing the work, then you start looking at character assets too. But we don't need assets are not necessarily something that you have to improve on in terms of like the reason they talk about character defects is that, you know, we're trying to correct problems, right? Like if I'm um, over controlling or (laughs) self-centered at times, you know, uh, that is problematic. So it's like, how can, with compassion, it's like, how can I find the middle ground again? It's like, and typically underneath that is like, oh, I'm holding some fear. I'm holding some limiting belief. There's you know, and that's to be treated with compassion, not condemnation, right? So people talk about how they have character defects, which is different than I am defective, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And, and you know, they started out like, because it's a, it started out sort of in a, from a religious, a religious place, they use the seven deadly sins, you know, pride, greed, sloth, um, lust, anger, stuff like And so what all those are, are, and it says it in the book, that they are natural human instincts, God get natural human, God given natural instincts that are out of balance. Right. And so that's not something that you're condemned for. It's like, oh, here, let's just bring it back to the middle. That's all. It doesn't have to be like, and and people will say, I I bristle, I prefer like human frailties or survival skills. And that's just my own thing. Mm-hmm. Um But uh, I prefer like a more compassionate, it's like, okay, well, let's find out where we're like, when I did my inventory, it's like, let's find out where I'm out of balance. And let's look at the fears that are underneath that. And what can we do to grow and evolve so that I don't feel the need to practice my survival skills anymore. Mm -hmm. And then we focus on assets because whenever you focus on expands, right? So I had a sponsor who had me list my positive character traits. And I was like, what is that? Right. Because when I think of like when you ask somebody who they are, they typically um, default to appearance, role, or achievement. Oh, I'm a coach. I'm a mom. I'm short, <laughs> you know, um, but that's not who I am. It's like, well, what are my character traits? Right. It's like I try to be compassionate. I try to be. Um, you know what I mean? Like the positive ones I had to, I had to Google a list and I go, go, okay, these are the things that I value. This is what I'm working towards, but uh, we're trying, you know, when you're, when I was in that early stage of um, dysfunction, I needed help identifying where, where, what was problematic. So that's why there's kind of this focus on character defects. That's just how they term it in the literature. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And I have another question for you about something. So you were mentioning, you know, your perception about 
people in AA were um, kind of at like a rock bottom, which you didn't identify with. And I have to say that was one of the biggest barriers for me getting going to AA was I just felt like um, I didn't quite resonate with my stereotype of this idea that you have to hit rock bottom to go to AA. So I was wondering if you could speak a bit on that. Like, is that a myth? Um, what's the experience like of that? So the funny thing is, is some people don't have to hit like a rock bottom, mm -hmm. but I, I feel like um, defining what a rock bottom is. Um, when I showed up, I had never been to jail. I had never been divorced or married. Um, I had never, I didn't lose my job. I still had my apartment. I still had a car. Do you know what I mean? So like I, I had all the stuff. Um, I was in like the nicest apartment I had ever been in. And do you know what I mean? So it wasn't like I lost all the stuff, but my rock bottom was I hated who I was mm -hmm. and I couldn't bear it anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't, I couldn't, I just needed to change. It was like, I was, but and, and drinking was my coping skill. Right. But I was so terrified to let go of it. Cause I didn't have anything else. I felt like I had tried everything else. I really did. I really felt like I had tried everything else. And so um, that was what rock bottom looked like for me was like this internal sadness and desperation and loneliness. It was dark at the end for me. It was dark. It was like, you know, I wasn't quite suicidal, but, you know, I didn't know how much longer I could carry on that way. Mm. I, was, I was just really sad. And that's what rock bottom looked like for me. And I would go to these meetings and I would see these women drive up in their little BMWs and little business suits. And I was like, oh, what? Like, it was so confusing. That's what I really, and then she would tell the story about how she used to be. And I was like, how does that, I couldn't connect the dots, like who she was as a person, like what she looked like and the stories that she was telling me. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well, maybe she's, maybe she can do it. I can do it too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Such a good example. Okay. I have one more question about a myth um, related to AA. So what I've heard always about AA, but I don't know because I haven't, I was not part of it, but something I heard was like, you can't do other forms of recovery. Like you can't be part of another group or organization if you do AA. And I was wondering if you could speak on that. Like, is that true? Or what's the, what's the approach to that? I'm so glad you said that. Um, um, the, so the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. That's what's in the literature, right? Mm -hmm. all, all, and that's it. Like literally that is it. Like you can still be drinking and go to meetings. It's not recommended of course, but <laughs> do you know what I mean? So like when I got sober, I wasn't that, I wasn't that person that just did my, I went to therapy. I was doing book study groups. We were reading like conversations with God and I was doing a course of miracles groups. I was doing um, meditation groups. Um, I'm kind of an obsessive learner. So I do you know what I mean. Like I was just doing all the things I was doing all the things so, um, yeah, you, yeah, that's, so that's not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a misperception. I think, you know, there's like mis misperceptions, um, miss, and then some of the things, some of the concerns I've heard are actually true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like there's some predatory behavior that happens there. Um, there are some people that are very controlling that happens. And, um, so I just want to validate that it's, there's some problems. Mm -hmm. Um, but there is a way around all the, the, it's a take what you, they literally, you'll hear this at meetings a lot, take what you like and leave the rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, you know, again, I can relate it to yoga. Like there's predatory behavior in yoga. There's controlling people in yoga, right? That doesn't mean that we should like completely ditch our yoga practice because of, you know, one or two people we encounter along the way. Yeah. And, you know, the hill I will die on is the 12 step process as actually a magical transformational process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the people can be problematic, but the process is actually really cool. And there's kind of a, a way, a workaround for every challenge or barrier that comes up, mm -hmm. but the transformate, the process itself is pretty, pretty cool. That's beautiful. Wow. This episode has like really re-inspired me. I think I might've told you that I was working the steps. Like I had a sponsor and then right after the recovery 
retreat, I was like, oh my God, I want to do the 12 steps. I'm like totally fired up by this. And then um, it was just difficult because she was in New York and I was in Bali and then our schedules mm-hmm. kept conflicting. And and then I traveled and for whatever reason, I just like lost touch with her for a couple months. And and you've inspired mm-hmm. me to like fire this up again and reach out to her. And uh, because so I do good. really want to do it. Like I just hear so many positive stories from people of how it impacted their life. Yeah. It's, it's such a cool process. It's hard to, it's an experience, right? Like I'm sure you've, you've like in meditation, I'm so glad you did the meditation thing in the beginning because like, it's like, Oh, that's right. It's a return to self and you get grounded and you invite love in and you let go of all the, I don't know, ego or whatever that is. Right. And we come back to the present moments. Like I get out of my head and into my heart again. And, and to me, that's kind of what the 12 step process has been like. It, it's, it helped me to let go of what wasn't mine so that I could bear the weight of what was. Mm-hmm. And it was often done in partnership with a loving companion or friend or guide or mentor. Yeah. It's just been such a, you know, magical process for me. It's beautiful. Yeah. Okay, and if you need help, you can always call me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was thinking that too. If my sponsor isn't free, I'll, um, I know who would be another good one. <laughs> this girl. Yes. Okay. I have a question for you because I know you have a book coming out. That's all about the myths about AA. So tell us a bit about your book. When can we expect it? And and what's it about? So it's called the 12 step guide for skeptics. And I haven't quite worked out the tagline yet, but it's, it's sort of like overcoming barriers to a path to sobriety is something like that. I'm still working on it. And the tagline part is that's tough. It's hard to encapsulate the whole thing. Um, but yeah, uh, after a lot, and I know I'm going to, so, so funny. I'm super excited about it, but I'm also a little bit nervous about it because I know there's going to be a lot of criticism. Like there's such vitriol against it and it's a lot of it is justified. (laughs) Um, but, uh, but I I really think it'll be helpful because I did it. I'm, I'm trying to do it in a really compassionate way. You know, I try to validate people's feelings, but I really think it's going to be like, Oh, I'm really hoping that at the end of it, people go, Oh, I can do this too. And just give like this, the process a try. Cause I think no matter where you are, like I heard this lady, she was, she came on the podcast. She was like 35 years sober. And after 20 years, she decided to go to meetings cause she needed more community or whatever. And I was like, Oh, I wonder what her life would have been like, had she gone at the beginning and her thing was the, the, you know, the God concept and stuff. So, um, I'm hoping to get it out for sober October, which is not likely, but maybe no booze November and if, which is possible, but if not definitely dry January, it'll be out. <laughs> oh, amazing. Well, I would love to have you join us back again when it is releasing. And, um, I'm super excited for you. I think it's such, such a valuable thing that I think is so needed. And I, I have to say, I was, I was scrolling on the podcast Instagram and I came across a video you, of you talking about this book and that's how we re got in touch. Although we had been we realized we had been emailing like two years ago or something. Yeah, I was like, I need to have this girl at sober girls club because I just think it's so, um, it's just so interesting to hear a different, a different perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I was like, I, I it was so funny because we kind of talked about a couple of years ago and then I got, I'm like a squirrel, you know, I get easily distracted. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad, but yeah, I guess I feel like everything happens on time when it's supposed to. So here we are. There you go. I thought you froze for a sec. I froze for a second. Yeah. But no, you're totally right. Everything happens on time. Like I feel like I needed to, um, to hear this message, uh, at this specific point so that I could reach, <laughs> re-reach out to my old sponsor and, and kind of restart that process. So you're absolutely mm-hmm. right. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was so nice to have you on my podcast too. And it was nice to meet all all of you today too. Thank you so much, Arlena.